Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. It's hard to believe that we've been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. So many great conversations over the years about so many great movies. All that said, producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. Becoming a Next Real member gives you access to all sorts of additional and exclusive content. Plus, you're helping us keep the lights on. Just head to the nextreel.com slash membership, where you can learn more about becoming a member, which costs a measly $5 a month, practically the same as one fancy coffee drink. And you get so much more. Every month, we record a bonus episode exclusively for members. Those episodes cover movies from whatever series we're covering at the moment or add to previous series. Some movies we've covered that only members get to hear us discuss include The Blues Brothers, The Russia House, Naked Lunch, Independence Day, The Hot Rock, and Relic, the better one. Plus, members get to vote on what we're going to discuss for those episodes. We also record additional pre- and post-show content in regular episodes that only members get to hear. Like conversations about similarly themed movies. And answering listener questions from our live member chat. Speaking of our live member chat, we record almost all of our episodes in Discord, where members can chat right along with us live. Members get access to other members-only channels in our Discord community as well. On top of all that, members get all episodes a full week earlier than everyone else in a private Next Reel feed just for them that includes all the shows in the Next Reel family. The Next Reel, the film board, movies we like, sitting in the dark, and more new projects on the way. To top it all off, members don't have to listen to ads. We've already eliminated those annoying, dynamically inserted ads that, let's face it, we all hate it. We are listening to you. We love podcasting for a living, and those ads help to pay the bills. Now, we're counting on you, dear listener. We promise we aren't going back to those terrible, dynamically inserted ads that don't relate to us at all. All we ask is that you consider supporting the Next Real family of podcasts with a membership. Again, it's $5 per month or $55 per year. Just head to thenextreel.com slash membership. Thenextreel.com slash membership. Get your access to early, ad-free episodes with bonus content, member bonus episodes, and access to member channels and live streams in Discord by signing up today. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to the next reel. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. Dark Star is over. Hello, Bomb. Are you with me? It is the future. Mankind has conquered the stars. He moves out to the endless interstellar reaches of the universe. 
an advance exploration call. A new breed of pioneer must seek out unstable planets and destroy them. The drive sequence begun. Hit it, pin back. of the 21st century planet smashers dark star all right andy uh dark star dark star have you seen this before or no <laughs> no 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 okay i did my full john carpenter uh, chronological watch a few years back and that was the first time i had seen this film and I walked into it uh, not knowing much about it other than it started as a student film and it was fairly low budget and it had kind of this cold following and it really did not work for me at all. I walked out one star, no heart, really didn't like it at all and just found it to be kind of uh, a boring, weird mess. And I liked the beach ball, but I didn't really care for much else. So rewatching it, I was a little uh, trepidatious going into this one, like, Ugh, is this going to be more of the same? But I ended up really surprising myself and clicking with it. And like I was in the vibe with it. And I don't know if it's because I had walked in having seen it before, so I knew what was coming. But I ended up kind of uh, finding it uh, just kind of a, a fun space story. And I ended up having a much better time with it than I did the first. Okay, I think you're just ahead of me. Yeah, probably. So this is one of those films. <laughs> I'm finding more and more often with films that I have not liked that I need to tell myself I owe it a second watch because inevitably when I go back, like I didn't like her the first time I watched it, loved it the second time I watched it. This film I didn't like, and I finally clicked with it. And, and I think that it's just one of those things. And, you know, it was it like, Kubrick said something to the extent of film is designed to be watched multiple times that when the art of film is moved into just like a one and done sort of mentality, then it's really just kind of becoming that consumer fodder. And it's not anything more than that. Yeah, it becomes a consumable, right? Yeah, exactly. And uh, just very disposable. And I, I just keep reminding myself that with these films that I revisit that I'm finding more to appreciate in them. And this was certainly one of them. I'm not going to say that I, I hated this movie because there were things in it that I absolutely appreciate. But the, in, by, the, by and large, what I appreciated was how you can see this movie directly inspiring successors, right? Like the, it, so much from this movie stands on the shoulders of and is one of the greats on which others stand in terms of how we communicate with AI, how we design spaceships. It just feels very much like he was he, he, he was thinking around the next corner, which I think is really fascinating. As much as I didn't connect with the thing as a whole, and I felt uh, sort of unrequited, like there were there the setup in the beginning is never really played out. In the end, I wanted some some more resolution to the whole <laughs> radi or like the radiation shielding setup. I I wanted more, and then there's of course the beach ball alien. It danced between a uh, like a serious science fiction exploration and a John Carpenter film in the cheeky John Carpenter film way. And and that's the thing that I felt like. Obviously, this is a student film. Obviously, it's a it is a thing where he's learning and and figuring out his craft. And I I totally respect it. This movie is also totally bonkers. <laughs> it it's very much bonkers. And I think there's something with the pacing of it and the 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 story, which is fairly fairly loose, I think is um, a fair way to describe it. But what it does in a really interesting way is set up the kind of the tedium of the idea of space exploration, as you have these people who've been out here for, you know, 20 years. And it's just like, the, you're you're getting these funny relationship like the tensions in some of the relationships and 
uh, the expectations and like, well, haven't, didn't he tell us this story four years ago? You know, just like these, these <laughs> really funny little moments and just the way that they kind of get lost in, in, in the most random of things. And, and just like, they just, there is this sense of disconnect that they have. Like the, the fact that they lost their commander is somewhat bothersome, but at the same time, it's not overly bothersome. It's just a thing that happened. And it really kind of fits into exactly where I picture John Carpenter and Dan O'Bannon at the time in film school coming up with this, uh, you know, likely, that post hippie generation that is, you know, lost looking at careers as, as less than exciting, especially this type of what you would see as like an alien progenitor with these uh, essentially kind of space truckers. Totally. You know, uh, but they also kind of have this hippie vibe of just this apathy. Like, sure, they, they'd love to get radiation shielding, but they also acknowledge the fact that, you know, it, it takes potentially years to get these messages back and forth. And so they're just like, yeah, whatever, I guess we'll just see. Should someone investigate this? Well, I guess we'll just wait and see if it actually goes bad. And if it does, then we'll fix it then. I don't know. There's something about the apathy and the... Yeah, and it's a fine line in this movie be between apathy and like fatalism. Like it's nothing's going to change and so we're all going to die. But that's kind of where the end of the movie goes. Like the the idea that... He's surfing on a piece of debris <laughs> down into the planet to burn up in the atmosphere and everybody's OK with that. Like it just it that crosses that line into like nihilism or not nihilism, fatalism. Like it's just the end and we're done. And it's been we've been out here 20 years, I think, at least. And they're really bad. like the, the fact that pinback isn't pinback like that was just lightly dropped into the story <laughs> that, that nobody really wanted to listen because they've heard the story but we hadn't and i was dying i thought that was actually a really funny way to introduce that bit to the narrative that he's trying to tell this story about the, how the real pinback uh, you know <laughs> didn't make it on the ship and that he instead is in there i thought that was really interesting the fact that you know you mentioned alien that the core conceit of what these guys are doing is driving around tr space, dropping nuclear bombs on planets that likely don't have life on them. My understanding is because they want to stabilize the star system. But that's exactly the opposite. It felt like I was watching Star Trek, like the Genesis version Star Trek, right? That was at three or four. Anyway, where they're going around, you can't do anything. I think it was Khan. You can't do anything to that planet if there is even a, a hint of life on it. It felt like we're actually making a movie because Dark Star decided to make the dark version where you just blow it up if it's at 95 percent chance that there's no life on it. I thought that was really funny. The the design of the spaceships, right? Like the opening show. Shot. The Dark Star pulls into frame and has brakes and stops, and you get <laughs> the profile of the X Wing, which I thought was amazing. <laughs> it just felt like, oh, we just saw that movie a couple of years ago. Let's go ahead and kick on up for Carpenter and actually design the X Wing with the R2D2 dome on top of it. I thought that was delightful. The alien hunt uh through for the the beach ball in the thing is is exactly what Cameron does in, in uh, you know, it just feels so much like this is a movie that or I should say Ridley Scott. This is much more of a Ridley Scott kind of play. And so, you know, there there's a lot going on in this movie that that has played elsewhere. And I appreciate every bit of that. And as a whole, I just didn't connect with the stoner part, like with the fact that these guys are such like hippies in space. And um, <laughs> I never quite got to that point. Oh, AI, right? We're talking about AI. We have multiple different AIs communicating with each other. And if this, I mean, I can't think of a better era for this movie to come back around than right now when we have multiple AIs that are now communicating with one another in our daily lives. Like, we could start an argument between Alexa and Siri right now if we wanted to and <laughs> just see what happens. So those kinds of things, I think, play uh, really interestingly for both comedy and and threat. Uh, yeah, and I think there's definitely an interesting element really explored here about the idea of possible damage to the ship that leads this AI bomb to 
uh, you know, have uh, issues with its commander or, or commands that have been given to it. And it says, I, I understand, but I have to, you know, I've already been given the timer. I have to detonate in 15 minutes. It doesn't matter that you can't get me off of the ship anymore. And and then to have that existential conversation with the bomb, uh, as as Doolittle does, and, and it becomes this entity of its own that is kind of, shut out everything else outside of it saying you know nothing else exists there is nothing but me and like what a funny turn for that moment to have where this bomb actually becomes sentient to a point where it thinks it's the only thing in the universe and uh you know ends up saying you know what i'm i'm just gonna detonate let there be light yeah well and and the you know taking a step back, the thing that I really have been sort of ruminating on is that, you know, it, it's because I think it was Talby who tells him, teach, teach the bomb phenomenology, right? And so he does, and the bomb learns it, right? And and that's the piece that I think is so interesting here is that, like, the, the message is, you we uh, just look at how careful we have to be when we teach these systems, because they don't have the benefit of nuance, right? They don't have the the benefit of being able to rationalize it against anything else. He taught him phenomenology, the bomb learned it, and it superseded every other bit of logic that was built into its system. And I thought that was that was a neat message for 1974, considering how prescient it is. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I, I think that also some of that existential conversation likely pulls from kind of just the the sorts of conversations you know hippies were having anyway at the time and just the idea of frustration with government but also kind of like this throwing up of your hands is like well this is the system in which we have to work and we'll just kind of roll with it but you can see why these characters kind of end up the way they do it, like the the hippie mentality kind of ended up making sense as i was watching it this time and i i i could understand when you're alone in the vastness of space for 20 plus years, especially Talby, who just never wants to come out of the crow's nest, essentially, on the ship is what we, what it may as well be. You know, he's just so taken by the vastness of everything and just you kind of lose yourself in it. And you can see where their headspace kind of goes into this direction. So I, I found that to be quite interesting. I think what you're what you're getting at actually helps me crystallize my central challenge with the the arc of the story, which is so much of the movie deals with some things that are absurd, but at least consistent across that mentality, right, of the the sort of feeling of isolation and abandonment in space, especially abandonment, even though they don't make a, a great deal about the fact that they're not getting their radiation shielding, right? It's just it deals with that overall thread. And then the movie at the very end turns absurdist and it turns absurdist in a way that doesn't to me on first viewing feel consistent with the rest of the movie. It felt like O'Bannon and Carpenter are are sitting there and they got to the point where they made a really great philosophical point. Right. They taught the bomb phenomenology. The bomb blew up anyway. They were outside the ship and they couldn't figure out a, a punchline. And so they made it a surfing thing. And, and I'm caught in an asteroid field and I'm going to be traveling the universe together or forever. And those though, the way those character journeys ended felt like they did sort of a disservice to the rest of the story. On, again, on my first viewing, it just felt like we're going to take this movie that actually asked some big questions and make it a joke. And it didn't the movie didn't set up as a joke to me. It set up like a thing they were trying to say, like they had a message. Does that make any sense? I mean, it makes sense. But at the same time, the whole film is so absurdist and jokey through the whole thing. Like the fact that the alien that they have is essentially a beach ball, beach ball with arms. Like there are so many things in the film that are, are already kind of nonsense that I don't think that I ended up really running into issues with some of those things. Because to a certain extent uh, it it all had been telegraphed like we already had those conversations it wasn't like the surfing thing was a surprise right like we had do little we know he likes surfing he talked the whole story and it was a real point of 
character for him that he missed surfing so much. Like that was the one thing that he had left. It, like he really, those memories of surfing were the things that he clung to. Talby was the one who talked about the Phoenix asteroids and how colorful they were. And they traveled the, you know, traveled the galaxies and all that and was kind of taken by that. And so it all kind of fit in. And in a way it ended up giving them, I mean, they were going to die anyway, lost in space with no spaceship, just floating. And so in some capacity, it gave them a way out that I think also fits into, I think there's, there is this sense of those final beats for these characters that, that was absurd, but it also fits into kind of the, the conscious, you know, just the conversations that they had had and, and like the, the places that they had, found to be most fascinating and and so to some extent i guess it just seemed like interesting character beats like things that made sense like hey if i'm going to burn up in the uh, atmosphere anyway i may as well go out surfing like it just i i guess i didn't end up having those issues this time it just ended up fitting the entire uh just all the absurdity with the entire story I think I, I think this that's why I want to be really careful and continuously say on my first viewing, because I think that I didn't know, like when I saw the beach ball alien, I was not sure if I should take it as a joke. Right. Because it could very well, knowing this is a student film, it could very well be a thing they wanted me to take very seriously as a as a because they just didn't have the budget to do anything else. So they spray painted a beach ball and put legs on it like that could have been the thing. I did get the joke, maybe, when he shot it with a trank dart and it deflated and bounced all over the place. Like, <laughs> I, I laughed at that and I thought, OK, maybe I maybe I should have taken that less seriously. But you see, like, I'm walking that line between like, OK, are we really are we trying to say something is how serious is this sci fi versus I'm not saying I ever at any point thought it was, you know, intended to be a, another 2001. But it just was asking bigger questions and maybe was philosophically punching outside its class. Well, and I think that might be one of the reasons that it has lingered through time as long as it has and over the decades. Because even at the time, like O'Bannon talked about that beach ball and said it was designed for laughs, but the audience wasn't laughing at parts of it. And he said, and I mean, this was kind of a famous quote of his that led to Alien. He said, if I can't make them laugh, then maybe I can make them scream. And he kind of took that beach ball creature running through the halls of the ship and turned it into the alien that, of course, um, is, is you know, much scarier. So for him, it was an interesting arc to get from one to the next project. But for audiences, it has become a thing that I think it it can be one of those things that you just don't get you know and it's just like what the heck is this thing am i supposed to be laughing at this or is this supposed to be serious and i think that can be one of the challenges with this film and you know again it's first time filmmakers doing something and seeing if it works and you know they're they're hitting for the fences with some of these crazy ideas yes. and and you know does the beach ball completely work it has its issues but at the same time it's unique I've never seen somebody do an alien that's just kind of this ball, this, this sentient ball with hands. And so it made it really funny in just kind of, but not like laugh out loud funny. It was like, huh, that is weird and unique and, you know, peculiar. And maybe it goes on a little too long. They, you know, they, again, they're pacing with, with this, they're, it, it demonstrates that they're learning, but it did demonstrate that they were trying some interesting things. Well, and and I think, you know, you talk about O'Bannon and it, it, this really feels like such an immediate predecessor to all of the ideas that he wanted to do, you know, spinning off of that quote. Right. He it's it's like you, you got to figure stuff out. And this movie is playing on how to figure stuff out. Like there are legitimately like intense sequences in a chase with a beach ball. Right. Like when he says that people weren't laughing in some parts. Yeah, it's because like you actually set me up thinking that the beach ball was a joke and then it becomes threatening. In, and that's the that's the friction. Right. That's the conflict that makes it scary because I didn't ex I expected it to be cute the whole time. And it, it, there are pieces that weren't cute. And even as I'm watching this 
incredibly prolonged sequence of a guy who no way could hold on to the bottom of that elevator as long as he did. (laughs) It was still, it became threatening, right? Because you just, like, it it became scary. Like, they were able to set up the beats of, like, I can't quite reach the, I can't quite reach the phone. Oh, yes, I can reach the phone. Oh, the line is dead. Oh, that's, well, that's funny and also scary. And then, oh, I have to press one. Oh, I can't quite make the, the one, but, oh, I can make the one. And, oh, there are, compression bolts and then they made it a punchline like they had an intense sequence and they made it a joke when he comes out with his hair all up and he's covered in in you know debris and he's still got the 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 frame of the floor wrapped around as a tutu you know that kind of of stuff i think is it it was uncertain of itself and it became certain in later movies when they amped it up as intense and then mel brooks did it you know, in space and made it funnier. But you can see where all those ideas kind of came from. That's, I think, the reason I appreciate this movie so much. Yeah, I, I think so, too. And it what's interesting is it also seems like Carpenter and O'Bannon were legitimately taking elements of this seriously. Like, they wanted to create something that didn't feel like Flash Gordon. They wanted to feel something that felt more akin to 2001 where i mean sure it's this is much more the hippies in space sort of thing but there are elements within the construction of the story i mean starting right out of the gate with kind of those those messages that you would get uh, from earth from mission command relaying notes and messages and things that had just kind of setting us up for this world where we're having conversations back and forth still, but it's going to take a long time to get on either end. And on our end, everything still has to go through the political machine to see, like, do we have enough in the budget to give you the radiation shielding you're requesting? And, oh, unfortunately, we don't, but we're sure you'll find ways to make it. Like, it, it felt very much part of the world that we're expecting. Next thing we have, the three of our characters... In the, um, I don't know what you'd call that, but like that little operations room. And that felt like they they pulled some strong images from the 50s space program. Very yes. tight and compressed. Everybody's sitting together, all facing different directions. The, all we needed was one of them to be hanging from the ceiling. And it would have felt like something more out of Apollo 13. Like he, they did a legitimately good job of kind of constructing these elements in this world that made me buy into it and that's always something that i've really reveled with john carpenter is the ability to build this world on whatever budget he has that ends up being effective and i found this to be um, an effective world that i bought into i want i I want you to because i think you're a bigger carpenter head than i am and and so I, i wonder if you could chart not the like sincerity of the science fiction but the the playfulness of the comedy from here on to his other works because obviously the thing isn't a funny movie but escape from new york definitely has some comedy and those i mean some of those movies i think are m- more interesting because he figured that piece out right the comic piece which i think is uncertain here i don't know if it's uncertain or just uh, they're sorting out like how to write the jokes to make them work because you can definitely get a sense of Carpenter's opinions about government bureaucracy and how some of that sort of stuff can, can mire things down. You know, you certainly see that in a number of his science fiction films that have kind of that riff on government process. And even in some of the characters, like, you know, you get some of that, anti it's not these ones aren't as anti-government as some of his later characters like snake plissken things like that that um, are very individual Uh, but again it it ties into kind of that nature of how the characters deal with things going on in their government and and certainly these characters are much more lackadaisical and resigned to accept the way things are rather than somebody like snake plissken like these ones again they, they don't get their radiation shielding their commander's dead. They're like, well, what's next? Right, right. And you just, I mean, you just said it. Like, these guys, I think, are less interesting because they are willing to accept that sort of fatalist approach. And when we get to Snake Plissken or Nada and they live, like, these are characters who absolutely categorically are not accepting the way things are. And I and playing them as, like, 
big, dumb, but absolutely serious in their mission is is, I think, what makes the comedy play. Well, yeah, but I, I think the fact that these ones are so resigned, I think, I don't know, for me, this time, and again, maybe this is just something that I'm noticing now, because, the, again, the first time I watched it, I really didn't like this movie. But I found that the way that they they behaved with decisions is, it, like, it really fit with these people who have been out on this mission for 20 plus years, there were, it's not like it was ending anytime soon from what we could tell. This is just something that they're going to be doing for the rest of their lives. Just like blowing up planets forever. Yeah. And, and so they just seemed so like, uh, you know, like tired of all of it, but just kind of going through the motions. And so I, I, I guess that's how I ended up reading it this time. It's just like, it's just another thing that they just have to sort through like just like their reaction to the fact that there's this broken element somewhere in the ship and we know because we've seen it happen with this uh, laser that broke but the computer can't find it and they are just like and, and you know Doolittle's like well and when he says to Talby he's Talby's like we got to find this he's just like uh, we can just wait until you know it actually does <laughs> something and then we'll deal with it then like he is so it's not even laissez faire. It's just like he's kind of given up on doing any uh, on action and it's all passive now. Like he's only going to do something if it's directly affecting him. And I just, it's an interesting reaction to that world of uh, just length of time, I think. Yeah. And, and it's, it's one of those movies that's like funnier in, it, it's funnier to talk about than maybe it is to watch so far for me. Like, I, I think it's funnier to talk about the stupid beach ball alien now that we're talking <laughs> about it. And, and the fact that they're on this ship that probably costs a billion dollars floating through space, dropping bombs that were the billion dollar bombs on the, that destroy planets. And, you know, now much funnier than it is like seeing it. Yeah, like, why do they even need to have smart bombs? Like, that's not even something that makes any sense. Like, <laughs> just know. drop the bomb. Why does it have to be a talking why smart does, bomb? <laughs> it's not just talking. It's like they're trying to make the bomb empathetic, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> I know things are hard yeah. for you on the ship. Good luck, guys. <laughs> Uh, so as somebody who is uh, notoriously allergic to technology, what do you think of the AI? Are you ready for that? Well, I, I'm not. <laughs> not sure. Do you see what I, I set you up as there? I yeah. set you up as the antagonist in this conversation. You sure did. You sure did. <laughs> I, um, you know, the ship's computer is um, a lovely lady. She's, um, but again, also, I think an interesting element, like for a computer that's running the ship, has very difficult time pinpointing issues that are happening. Like, why is it so hard for the ship's computer to pinpoint the issue is that laser? You know, it takes her, you know, almost the full length of the film before she, or maybe half the film, because that's when Talby goes down there. But it just takes a ridiculously long time to track that down. But yeah, that again, going back to our earlier conversation about the AI, it's such an interesting uh, window into the evolution of AI that actually is quite frightening when you see how the bomb takes that information that he gets from Doolittle and and becomes its own god, really. Yeah, for sure. I found it really compelling. And I also, in terms of introducing the AI, I think it, I, it checked me on this, but I think they introduced the bomb AI before the computer AI. So we didn't hear sexy computer voice until after we'd heard Nebushi nerd bomb voice. Um, I can't speak to that completely. It's entirely possible we heard something from the ship's computer first. But again, it is just kind of a a voice thing that you hear often in these sci-fi movies. It's just this, not even necessarily a smart computer, just a voice that is telling you of things that you need to be aware of, you know, and, and, and it it's entirely possible because, I mean, it, that's something that was, but Star Trek has that, right? A voice that you can talk to? Yeah. 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 The computer and absolutely it, it does. It was Major it's an, Major it, Barrett was the and no, it's AI. Was. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, and that was in sixty six, right? Like that was yeah, that so was just introduced pull, very very early, right? So just pulling that same sort of element, and so that's probably why I wasn't even thinking much of it until later. But it is this one is kind of fun. Like I must disengage your recreational music. Yeah, like the way that she kind of like handled things and. And new things like, okay, you're hanging from the bottom of the elevator. 
you better get out of there because the elevator is moving now. Like, we'll just stop the elevator. You're the ship's computer. Just make sure that the elevator doesn't, you know, kill me. But it's not that smart. <laughs> well, and that's actually really interesting because I think that gets to that. That's what makes Dark Star a gag on movies that were dealing with sentient like AI or not even sentient, but just like generative intelligence before this movie came out, right? Because again, we had computer in Star Trek, we had HAL in 2001, like those were the serious computers that helped you get work done and provided this sense of ominous evil in in 2001 case, it, you know, it's out of hand. Uh, and that makes this movie a send up of those things, which I think is funny. I think it's legitimately funny the way they talk to each other. And I think that's the joke is like, let's what makes computer AI funnier is when they don't agree, when we introduce multiples and they don't agree with each other. And I thought that was great. Yeah, that was fun. To we know they don't agree sense. with humans already, but not agreeing with each other. <laughs> right. And, you know, and and the bomb won't listen to to the ship's computer. And so it's just kind of interesting to see that relationship. Yeah, I thought that was fascinating. We're looking at a lot of beginning, beginning actors here. Like these are uh, to the point where it's not like these people are getting credited and much else. Brian Norell plays Lieutenant Doolittle. Dan O'Bannon, of course, is uh, Sergeant Pinback. In addition to also being uh, the co-writer on this, the editor, the production designer, the visual effects supervisor, very busy person. And Cal Cunaholm uh, is Boiler. And uh, I don't even know, uh, Andre Andreja Payhitch played Talby, who had such a strong accent that John Carpenter actually had to dub the voice for Talby. So, uh, and plus we have Joe Saunders playing the frozen Commander Powell. I loved the fact that they're able to still tap into the brain patterns of Commander Powell enough to still have conversations with him. I found that to be such a fascinating, oh my goodness. interesting yes. element. That you're absolutely right. I, I'm so glad you brought that up. That was that was one of those fantastic, shocking and and sort of horrific ideas. The fact yeah, that that really he was. says it's been a long time since anybody's been down here, that he's frozen in ice and just thinking like he's just there aware that time is passing and nobody's hanging with him. That's terrible. What a terrible idea to introduce to the world. A horrible idea. Very fascinating and a great look, that frozen body just kind of like staring up at you, like really oh. creepy. And then, of course, he is also tossed out into space. So possibly the only entity who will still be floating across the galaxies thinking in some capacity. Uh, well, I don't know. I guess it's hard to know where Talby's going to end up. But um, yeah, so strange. Wait, Talby was... Talby went off with the Phoenix The, uh, the Phoenix asteroids. Yeah. yeah. I have every reason to believe he's going to just freeze and die, right? Like, I think his entity... I don't know. Because he made such a strange thing of the, the Phoenix asteroids, how it's like they're glowing and it's like these rainbow colors and everything. I was like, so is his... is Because they take him. Like, they. it seems like the Phoenix asteroids come and grab him and take him off. So I don't know if that's just his version of heaven that he just went off to um like did it literally just happen i don't know but it was a it seemed like some form of an entity that did something just it was a strange little moment lieutenant doolittle is the only one who i felt actually died when he like burned up in the in the atmosphere of the planet well yeah i guess that's right yeah but do you like the performances does it feel like well this is about what i expect for something like this yeah I think this is about what I expect for something like this. Actually, I, I'll take that back. I think it's better than I expected for something like this. Like, I've seen a bunch of student films. And in fact, uh, I, I think everybody in here was better than I expected uh, going into this movie, which was really satisfying. Like, it felt like a complete film to me, uh, you know, apart from the like, I'm approaching it as if I just watched Escape from New York, right? Or They Live. Like, I'm approaching it as if there's something to criticize. But this was like an A-plus work, man. You did a great job. You made a movie that, that's complete. I didn't care for the hippies in space bit, but everybody, like, felt like they were in scene. Nobody felt like they were just, you know, there to play. Yeah. I thought it was great. Yeah, it, it, it did surprise me. I mean, it was a 45-minute short initially, shot on 16 millimeter, and uh, then... They ended up having this Canadian distributor agree to uh, give them additional money to shoot 
um, an additional 50 minutes to make it feature length so that they could actually um, get theatrical release. So, yeah, it's interesting kind of the, the, the route that they went in order to make this thing uh, work. And this it's kind of fun. And, you know, it's also fun to see them playing with things like... I mean, it's it's not like a first film where they're just doing a drama. It's like they're doing a, a science fiction film with model work and all these different effects, and they have to come with this alien. They have to do this hyperspace sequence where they've got to animate it. They've got to do a lot of really interesting lighting setups and, and things like uh, when they were going through hyperspace, like how they have everybody is almost like frozen in place and kind of lit up and stuff. They did some interesting elements in here that... Uh, for a first film, it's like, you know, they were really aiming big with what they were trying to accomplish here. So it's it's exciting to see how Carpenter really was trying to do something more. Well, and I, I think you have to you you have to include O'Bannon's <laughs> O'Bannon's lament. It sounds like a, a poem or a Dixie Chicks song. It's just the chicks now, right? When he said we had what would have been the world's most impressive student film and it became the world's least impressive professional film, that's spot <laughs> on. Like if if I go into this watching it as if I'm watching a student film, it's incredible. And, you know, also the first time I watch it with its real cover and it looks like it's available for rent that I pay money for now 50 years later uh, it is a, a less impressive professional science fiction film. Well, and I, I think that's always going to be the case. And it's yep. like that that's something with a film like this. It's hard to pair this even opposite something like Alien that O'Bannon would subsequently work on. Like that's a, a tricky thing. Like this feels very beginner. But when you do have that understanding going into it, you know, I think that there is this element that you can find to um to kind of still enjoy a lot of the elements in it and you know i'm I'm glad i yeah i'm glad i did because it worked yeah. better for me this time yeah and do you get a sense when you watch this movie that you can answer the question why would you give any of these people money to make another movie the answer for me is absolutely i get that like i understand why they would they would go on to make more movies yeah, I, it's very clear that they're coming up with interesting concepts. They're aiming big with uh, the look, the style. It feels like it feels unique. It you know catches your attention. Like okay, there's this crazy beach ball alien. What the heck is going on with this? But somehow it plays, and it I find it to be an interesting um, kind of uh, attempt at something. And so yeah, it, it it's clear that they're doing something, and you can see why these this pair would uh, go on from here for sure for sure it is have have they done anything since Did, is this the only time they actually work together though o'bannon and uh and carpenter i'm looking at o'bannon now i don't think that they worked on anything together after this well it looks like after this o'bannon specifically was tapped by alejandro jodorowsky uh, to work on his version of Dune that fell apart. And that left him broke, homeless, dependent on friends for survival. George Lucas was impressed with uh, some of the work he did on on this. He, so he uh, did some work with him on Star Wars. And that's when he and, and Ronald Shusett, uh wrote Alien and uh, went on from there. Because Carpenter... Yeah, so he did Assault on Precinct 13 in 76. Someone's Watching Me was a TV movie in 78. He helped on uh, The Eyes of Laura Mars and Halloween. And oh, Elvis was not till 79. He and uh, Russell started. So. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's it's odd. I just wonder if there were some elements with O'Bannon. I don't know. It's just it's interesting that they ended up seeming to have part ways, you know. So, OK, so Halloween two, Carpenter didn't direct, but it's reported that O'Bannon did uncredited work on the script with Carpenter and Deborah Hill. How about that? OK, OK, we'll take it. That was still 1981. And that's you know, just a few years after this one. And 
they haven't worked together since. Yeah. I wonder if they're friends. I wonder what they're doing. Yeah, it, it, it does make you wonder. Another name that pops up in this film that people may recognize tied to Carpenter is Nick Castle. Yes. It's kind of fun to see him pop up here. He is the uncredited alien. And he also is the uh, was a camera assistant on this film. And I was like, oh, I did not know that was where Nick Castle started. But that was that was certainly interesting to me that um, it made more sense that he was the alien. <laughs> yeah, much more sense that he was the alien. <laughs> yeah. And Frozen in Ice, uh, Joe Saunders and Miles Watkins as Mission Control. Dude, Miles Watkins went on to direct 15 episodes of The Commish. Of course. Uh-huh. Lots of TV. Douglas Knapp was the cinematographer for this, who uh, would continue on with Carpenter for Assault on Precinct 13, Escape from New York. Well, and Cookie Knapp was the vo voice of computer. So many naps. Yeah. You know, in large part, the thing that's most interesting to me about uh, about all these, like, the the small bit people is just how surprised I am that they haven't gone farther in their careers. Like some of them went on and stayed with Carpenter and, and or O'Bannon, but they, the principal crew besides O'Bannon, like they really haven't done much. And I think they really could have, like I, I bought all of them as first film performances. Uh, I, I could have seen them doing something else. Yeah. It's, but it does like in these early films, it does make you wonder you know, it's it's hard to get into the industry. And even with yeah. a film like this, it's just it speaks to kind of the challenge that people have of uh, making it, you know. But I mean, you do see people and that's what's interesting, like Tommy Lee Wallace, who would go on to a number of things, including a lot of directing, was on this as uh, an associate art director. And Ron Cobb did special effects. And, and so there are names in here. And it's just interesting to see a lot of people potentially starting here. But again, a lot of people, you know, just trying to get their start, but never quite getting anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well. Yeah, I, I think I, I think the film was was interesting as a whole, it, you know, in pieces, it is it, there are some some places that I think are really great, and as a whole, it left me a little wanting. But again, as a student film, A plus, E for effort. Yeah. All right. Well, we will be right back. But first, our credits. The Next Reel is a production of True Story FM, engineering by Andy Nelson, music by Theater of Delays, Oriel Novella, and Eli Catlin. Andy usually finds all the stats for the awards and numbers at d-numbers.com, boxofficemojo.com, imdb.com, and wikipedia.org. Find the show at truestory.fm. If your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, please consider doing that for our show. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to sport our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Hemp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films... 
head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. All right, Andy. Sequels and remakes. When could I, did I miss Dark Star 2 through 5? <laughs> <laughs> it's not something that really had any sequels and uh, has never been remade, but it certainly has been influential all the same. There were a lot of people who saw it and clicked with some of the the uh, stuff within this film. People have said how there were elements that they pulled from this to create uh, the sci-fi sitcom Red Dwarf. It was inspiration for the uh, Machinima series Red vs. Blue uh, Metal Gear, one of the voices in that was inspired from this. Uh, the town Benson, Arizona, actually has a road named after the film. A number of bands, uh, the group Pinback got its name from him. Um, Erasure used samples of lines for for one of their songs. Hu- same with Human League. It's just, it's one of these things that uh, is kind of, long been drawn in including you know we, a movie we talked about on the show danny boyle's sunshine one of the characters in that is named pinbacker which was inspired by pinback here so it is one of these interesting films that clearly has drawn in a lot of people and they've found uh enough in here to kind of pull from just because it's inspired them in one way or the other we are here to talk about it because <laughs> because of awards Oh, yes. <laughs> I don't know why. It's hard to say that with a straight face. Why are we here, Andy? How did it do at award season? Yeah, this is uh, a film that did not get a lot of award uh, nominations or awards. Uh, but again, it's it, the type of release that it got. It probably, you know, didn't get much in the way of uh, recognition in those circles. But over at the Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror, uh, the Golden Scroll, it was nominated for Best Special Effects, and it won that award. Uh, we are here because we we're talking about the Hugo Awards Best Dramatic Presentation. This was nominated but lost to A Boy and His Dog, which we talked about last week. And this was nominated at the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America Awards of the Nebulas for Best Dramatic Writing but lost to Young Frankenstein. This, I think, would make an interesting double feature with A Boy and His Dog. I would watch those two movies, too. Oh, yeah. We, we've essentially kind of done it just over a course of a week. <laughs> we really did. <laughs> All right. Uh, how'd we do at the box office? He had seventy two fifty to make this movie, right? And some yeah, of that right. went to burgers and pizza. <laughs> well, if we thought LQ Jones had a small budget for his film last week, that is nothing compared to what Carpenter was working with here. His film truly was indie with just a budget of 60000 oh, This is what I found. 60000 which is 382000 in today's today's dollars. I think that was tapped into the specific money he spent initially. I may be wrong on that. Um, and then he might have had some additional funds, but I couldn't find anything about that. So all I have is the 60000 That's what I'm going to go with. The movie premiered at Filmex, or LA's International Film Expo, on March 28th, 1974. They sold it to Bryanston Pictures, which released it in 50 theaters January 16th, 1975. I have no idea how it did, as I could not find any box office information for this one. But on such a low budget, I'd like to think that at least it made some money back at the, at the time. And if it didn't, it certainly must have by now. <laughs> 50 years later... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure something happened for this movie. I mean, it sounds like this was playing in theaters on and off until at least 1980. So it's yeah. one of these cult films that just kind of was kept drawing those late night people back. That's amazing. It's amazing. I, it's great. It's great. Uh, okay. Well, I, I'm i glad we watched it for sure. I'm really glad we got to watch it right back to back with Boy and His Dog. And I'm uh, r- just really excited about the triple feature that is yet to come with next week's movie uh, yeah it will be an interesting one i'm glad to have revisited this one um only if if for no other reason than to now not have it rated so low on john carpenter's uh, films because it's fun i enjoy this i probably now would have to put like uh, memoirs of an invisible man at the bottom of his list because that's just a mess of a film but anyway as pete said we'll be right back for our ratings but first here's the trailer for next week's movie cannot wait for this one monty python and the holy grail 
once in a lifetime, there comes a motion picture which changes the whole history of motion pictures. A picture so stunning in its effect, so vast in its impact, that it profoundly affects the lives of all who see it. One such film is... Very good, thank you. Yes, thank you. Next, please. Once in a lifetime, there comes a motion picture which changes the whole history of motion pictures. Uh, yes, thank you. Next. Once in a lifetime! Go away. What? Next. What's wrong with my voice? My voice is alright, my brain is wrong. Yes, That's more like it. Kurosawa's Seven Samurai is the same movie. And Ivan the Terrible. The rest of them are normal movies. Like Herbie Rides Again, La Notte, and Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Monty Python and the Holy Grail, you If you do not open this door, we shall take this castle by force. When One day, lad. All this will be yours. What, the curtains? Run away! There are some of the most dangerous things in the world. Run away! We've got a witch! What makes you think she's a witch? Well, she turned me into a newt! But she and the Seven Seal to compare. This movie is very young. No! So, if you are a young man of the world, you like to laugh at what you like. You can't do it much better. Monty Python and the Holy Grail. You can watch it. Come here to eat food. It is hard to believe we've been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. You're telling me producing this show week after week is so much fun, but it does require a lot of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. The Originals page at thenextreel.com slash originals links to the source material for all of our adapted film discussions. Purchasing through our links supports the show. In season 13, we explore various awards categories and the films nominated in them. We wrapped up our 1940 Best Picture series with adaptations of Mice and Men from John Steinbeck and Wuthering Heights from Emily Bronte's novel, not to mention the play Dark Victory by George Brewer Jr. and Bertram Block. The 1947 Academy Award adapted screenplay series featured Anna and the King of I am based on Margaret Langdon's book, plus The Best Years of Our Lives, Brief Encounter, and The Killers. The 1952 cinematography nominees included Death of a Salesman and A Streetcar Named Desire, A Place in the Sun, based on both a play and a book, and Strangers on a Train, based on Patricia Highsmith's first novel. So many great movies based on books and plays, like Beckett, The Pumpkin Eater, A Boy and His Dog, Rollerball, The Princess Bride, Congo, The Scarlet Letter. Jackie Brown, The Deep End, The Gray, The Woman in Black, and Top Gun Maverick, which I'm very much looking forward to revisiting. Get the source books at thenextreel.com slash originals. Start your next read or reread from the movies we've covered. Visit thenextreel.com slash originals today. Letterbox Andy, what are you going to do with your stars? You rated it one star no heart, I think, before? I did. Really curmudgeonly. Well... I had a hard time with it. I ended yeah. up enjoying it a lot. It still has a lot of issues. I'm going to give it three stars and a heart, though, which, you know, Ooh. that's a pretty good jump. 
I felt really generous with my one star and a heart. Like this feels like it could <laughs> take take a, a, a real uh, place on the pedestal of uh, guilty pleasures because it's not it's still not a great movie, but there's a lot, <laughs> there's stuff to love. <laughs> so we'll see. Maybe it will inflate over the years, and I will have to steal more stars from the finest hours and give them <laughs> to this movie. Well, that. Uh, gives this an average over on our account on Letterbox at two stars with a heart. So it's a low rated, but we enjoyed it. Remember, you can find me at Soda Creek Film, and you can find Pete at Pete Wright, and the show at The Next Reel over on Letterbox. So check us out over there. And uh, what did you think about Dark Star? We would love to hear your thoughts on this one. Hop into the Show Talk channel over in our Discord community, where we'll, where we will be talking about it this week. When the movie ends. Our conversation begins. Letterbox giveth, Andrew. As Letterbox always doeth. Oh, Andy, how do you handle uh, picking a review for this movie? Did you go high or low? What'd you do? Bottom of the barrel, top of the barrel, skimming the skimming the curds. I went to highest reviewed, or you know, as far as like the review activity. Four star by Joe. Four stars in a heart. In times of trouble, it has often been a great comfort to me to go outside on a particularly dark night and look up into the sky to contemplate the vast, incomprehensible infinities that make up our universe, the swirling galaxies and the exploding supernovas, the black holes and the glittering nebulae, and think to myself. There's probably something really stupid going on up there. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's pretty good. I have one that I think really gets to the point of everything Carpenter and O'Bannon and crew were trying to do. It's a three and a half star by a dear 237 who says the visuals were great. I want to shove the atmosphere of this film up my ass. <laughs> Oh, God. Uh, thanks, Letterboxd. <laughs>